Yeah, so, okay, so I'm gonna talk about this kind of mouthful. Actually, there's a, there'll be a fair bit of overlap with things Juan said, but maybe if you hear it a second time, you understand it better, so that's okay. Um, so, let me start, though, with a little bit broader perspective. So, so one of the big goals, I think, of the SIP from Cubic Collaboration is thinking about the black hole interior. How do we understand the emergence of the black hole interior? Uh, and, well, recently, a, you know, a lot of progress has been made using tools from quantum information theory, sort of working on the qubit side of the it from qubit. Um, but for me, I've actually kind of been getting a big back, back more towards thinking about the it side. Um, so, you know, I, you know, the gravitational side of things is important too, and actually for me, I feel like my, my current bottleneck is, is more on the gravity side. I, 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 the things I don't understand about gravity are more frustrating than the things I don't understand about information theory. Um, so, and in particular, there's this funny thing in gravity that, that time translation is a gauge symmetry, which is something that, uh, from a quantum, quantum information point of view, is kind of weird, but, but and it's something that I, I feel like I, somehow I, need, I at least need to understand it better. Um, so, so for example, um, so let's consider a few different time slices of the hartle hawking state. Okay, so here's our favorite one. Um, and then, you know, and then we could say, okay, so the thing people often like to do is evolve up, you know, evolve time up on the boundaries. And then we could run that slice through the bulk in two different ways. And, you know, if you talk to, uh, you know, people like uh, Lenny and Adam and Ying and Rob, they'll tell you that, you know, up here you're learning something about the geometry behind the horizon when you evolve the state up here. But, I mean, are you really? I mean, when we extend it into the bulk, it can always just go back down like that. And so we're actually not learning about the interior, right? To, to get from here to here, it actually has nothing to do with the Hamiltonian on the boundary. All this, you know, complexity increasing with the boundary time or whatever, right? That's not, you know, that, that, that's true in between this slice and this slice. But actually, you know, all the, all the physics you can think of maybe on this slice, it's not behind the horizon. So somehow the thing you really need to understand is the gauge transformation that moves this slice up into this one. Somehow that's the thing that you really tells you about what's going on in the interior. Um, but, but this gauge transformation, right, it acts trivial on the Hilbert space. So how, how are we going to learn anything from it, right? I mean, uh, so I, that, that's somehow that's part of my confusion. Um, so an another thing where, where these gauge constraints, I think, are also confusing is something that I call the factorization problem, which is something that I and then also Monica and, and Daniel wrote about. Um, you, so if you think about the CFT as having two asymptotic boundaries, right, and it tensor factorizes into the CFT on one sphere and the CFT on the other sphere. Um, in the CFT description, but in the bulk, there are gauge constraints that connect the two sides because it's connected through the bulk. And so, for example, like this thing here is supposed to be a Wilson line that goes from one boundary to the other, so it's some gauge invariant operator in the bulk. But it, if you try to cut it, at least naively, you get something that's not gauge invariant. So, so somehow, somehow the... The, this Gauss constraint here sitting in the, at the horizon or wherever else you want to cut, somehow it can't really apply or somehow it has to be only approximate or something like this. And so this is what I call a factorization problem. Um, so, uh, and so I, I argued in, in 2015 um, for the e &M version of things that, that to do this split, you need to have the gauge field be emergent in some theory where there, there are objects that carry fundamental charges uh, underneath under the gauge symmetry, roughly speaking, so you can cut the Wilson line in two by sticking charged operators uh, here and here. And then this gives you something gauge invariant on one side and something gauge invariant on the other side. Um, uh, but, but I wasn't able to say too much about gravity. Um, now, dividend morphism invariance, I think it's also important for the firewall problem, which is something that we all sort of somehow don't talk about anymore, although probably we all still think about it. Uh, so if you think they're firewalls, and I guess some people still do, uh, then, then where are the firewalls supposed to be, right? Usually people say they're at the horizon, but of course they're not at the horizon because the horizon doesn't mean anything. You know, the horizon is a teleological concept. Uh, but then if you think that there's really something dynamical happening where, somewhere where you hit it and then you die, then, then there needs to be some gauge invariant way of saying where that firewall would form. Uh, so. And, and what do we think about, so say if that place is different from the horizon, which it would be in general, then what do we make of that? Um, okay, and then also, you know, in all this stuff that we have been talking about for the last few years, you know, chaos and error correction, traversable wormholes, um, it's actually in all those stories, if you think about it, it's very important to describe gauge invariant observables because, you know, a lot of the physics has to do with like how the observables move around 
as you change the geometry, right? Like if you put in some shock wave and, you know, then where, you know, the horizon split or something, or, you know, when is something in or not in the code subspace, that kind of story. Um, so, so today, so, you know, I, I just somehow feel like this all needs to be put together in some better way than it has already. And so today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about some attempts to start doing this in the simplest theory of gravity that I know, uh, which is this Jakiv Teitelboim theory of gravity. Uh, so, and this is based on, uh, I guess, work in progress with Daniel, uh, who may also talk about some related things in his talk. I don't know. Um, okay. So, so, okay. So now, now let's proceed. So the standard way of thinking about this, which you just heard about from Juan, is that you talk a lot about the Schwarzian uh, and you talk a lot about these s to r symmetries. Uh, and so for me, I, I have to say, I really, you know, I, this is, you know, it's not wrong, but I find this very confusing, right? Because the, the Schwarzian theory in Lorenzian signature has zero degrees of freedom. So, so what does it even mean? And, and these symmetries aren't symmetries, right? So, so one of the s 2 rs like Juan said, is, is really a r. It's time translation, and the rest is broken. And the other s 2 r just, just does nothing on the Hilbert space, it's uh, identity. So, so I, I don't know, I just somehow, it, it, to me it seems like this is not necessarily the, the most practical way to really ask what's the gauge invariant stuff going on. Why, why do you think about the um, Well, yeah, think, 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 think about the Lorenzian Schwarzian theory on one boundary. If you just, you get rid of the SL2R, there's nothing left. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's a technique for doing the Euclidean path integral. So, uh, so I'm going to study this system using this kind of more traditional methods of canonical quantization and, and doing the path integral in the original bulk gravitational degrees of freedom, the metric and phi, the scalar. Uh, but I mean, I should say, I mean, I don't want to say that, I don't want to say anything here was wrong or uninteresting. Obviously, it's very interesting and correct. It's just I, somehow I feel that this approach I'm going to give today I think is maybe complementary and at least some things I think are really more clear. Uh, in this way of thinking about it, because there's nothing fictitious around. There are no fake symmetries and there are no fake degrees of freedom. Um, okay, so, so let me begin with a warm up, uh, which is uh, just doing um, Maxwell theory on, on a line interval in one plus one dimensions. So, uh, so, so, so here's the line interval, it goes from zero to L and time is going up. Okay, so we all know the Lagrangian. Uh, we probably even all know the variation of the action, but well, certainly we know that part, that's the equation of motion, uh, but, but then there's also this boundary term here, right, that says that when you vary the action, there's a piece proportional to r mu, which is the radial ve normal vector going out, and then the variation of a. And so, uh, so actually this is a bit what Juan was referring to in the, in the Jakeev Teitelboim case in his talk, so when you, when you choose the boundary conditions, you have to make sure they're consistent with, with having a good action principle. And here, uh, the easiest way to do that is you say that the gauge field at the edge has to be uh, radial, so there can't be any a0 at the boundary, because if there were some, if you were allowed to have A0, then you would have this boundary term not vanishing under variations uh, around uh, things that are supposed to be solutions. Uh, and then to preserve these boundary conditions, you have to only quotient by gauge transformations which go to zero at the boundaries. Um, okay. So uh, then uh, in this theory, the equation of motion is pretty simple. It just says d mu F01 is zero, so it says that uh, you just have a constant electric field. So uh, now uh, we can ask, uh, so that at least is one physical degree of freedom, right? We can measure the electric field, see whether it's there or not. Um, but we can ask, is that the only degree of freedom? And, and somehow it's clear the answer should be no, because phase space is even dimensional. So if this is going to be a good Hamiltonian system, there better not only be one degree of freedom. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so let's try to find the other one. So, so first we can just go to temporal gauge. Uh, and so we can do that using the loud gauge transformation, meaning yeah. Well, yeah, you can. No, I didn't. I don't want to say this is the only consistent one, but you. But there, are, there are many that are inconsistent. So with this action, the only ones I would say you're allowed to do is you can set r f mu nu r mu to zero, or you can, can set you can set a mu to be radial. You, either of those choices is okay. That's basically whether you allow, um, well, in higher dimensions, it's whether you allow Wilson or Tuff lines to end at the boundary. Here I'd have to think uh, a little bit exactly what to say about the other one, but it's the one plus one analog of that. One of those 
What? Yeah, 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 I think the other choice here will have no degrees of freedom. That's correct. That's yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no. Oh, sorry, no, no, no. What's inconsistent is to pick some mixed boundary condition without adding other terms to the action. That's, that's what's not allowed. Yeah. Um, okay, and... Uh, you, you, I mean, yeah, you, you might be able to break things in a way that you can fix it by adding more stuff at the boundary. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to say this is the only boundary condition. Just this is a consistent boundary condition to study. And there, there are ones that are inconsistent. Those are the only statements I'm going to make. Um, okay, so yeah, so we can go to temporal gauge so we can get rid of A0. Uh, and so then this equation of motion that E is constant just tells us that A1, the spatial part of A, is, uh, is uh, minus E times T. Plus a, plus a constant little a. Uh, and so you can ask, is this little a physical? Um, clearly, there's not going to be more than two degrees of freedom. Uh, so, so e and a are the only options. We can ask, is a real? Uh, and the answer is yes. And it's not totally obvious, because you can remove a by doing illegal gauge transformation. right? If I define lambda equals minus a x, if I do that, then I can just get rid of this a. But this is a gauge transformation that doesn't obey the boundary condition, so it's not allowed. So, and in fact, A is basically this Wilson line I mentioned before. It's the Wilson line that goes from one end of the interval to the other end of the interval. And so that is a real degree of freedom. Okay, so, so, so now let's uh, do a similar discussion for Jakeev Teitelboim. So uh, this is more or less the same action that Juan wrote down, except I was a little more careful and I included all the boundary terms. Um, so uh, you can compute the variation of this action. So there's some part proportional to the equation of motion. We already talked about that. And then there's this this variation of the boundary terms here. Okay, the, the boundary terms and the variation, that's fair. Okay. Um, so, uh, so again, we have to pick a good set of boundary conditions where the variational principle is uh, well-defined. Uh, and so, so you see, so the obvious things to do is, you see there's a delta phi here, so we can um, fix the uh, phi, the scalar that Juan talked about. We can fix that to be a constant at the boundary. And then we can fix the induced metric at the boundary. And so that causes both of these terms to vanish. So that's at least one good set of boundary conditions. And in ADS-CFT, these are, would be kind of the, the, standard, or the standard boundary conditions to choose. Um, and then this RC is a parameter which we take to infinity. So that's like the cutoff, the IR cutoff. So we take RC to, going to infinity. So that's the scaling limit where the metric gets infinitely big to, to get into uh, something that's really ADS-2. OK, so, uh, so then we can ask again about the diffeomorphisms that are allowed by the boundary conditions. So, so, it, so remember the boundary conditions, you have to fix the induced metric on the boundary. So to get a, a, a gauge transformation that preserves the boundary conditions, you have to have it approach an isometry of the boundary metric, which in this case is just time translations. Um, uh, and then in fact, as, what SI implicitly did in the electromagnetic example, um, I, so I, we only quotient by diffeomorphisms which go to zero. So the ones which approach a non-zero time translation uh, and infinity will take to act non-trivially on the phase basis asymptotic symmetries. And so also in electromagnetism, that would be like the charge, the electric flux at infinity. So we don't set that to zero. Um, OK. So uh, yeah, and in fact, these time translations are generated by some boundary stress tensor here. So this is basically the variation of the path integral with respect to the boundary metric, which actually is sitting right here, because I did the variation for you. And so you can see that this is what it is, the stress tensor. Uh, this is basically the same thing as the ADM Hamiltonian, but, it, but it's not quite because there are two, two boundaries. Right? We're studying this theory again on this, this space time, which is an interval times time. So, so we have to add the stress tensor on the two sides to get the, to get the full Hamiltonian of the canonical system. Um, okay. All right, so now let's talk about solutions of these equations of motion. So locally, they're always ADS2 because you had this, this term here. Oh, oh, I forgot a plus 2 here. Sorry, my bad. This is R plus 2. <laughs> OK, so I was more careful, but I wrote it wrong. So I guess one wins. <laughs> I, I wrote the boundary terms right, but I missed the two. This is R plus 2. So then the, the, the equations of motion impose that you're always locally ADS2. Uh, so ADS, ADS2 is, is this uh, sub-manifold in, uh, in uh, 1 comma 2 signature Minkowski space. Um, and then the solutions for the scalar are, are parametrized by families of hyperplanes intersecting this, uh, this uh, hyperboloid in the space. So these a, b, and c, you can think of as like the normal vector to uh, the hyperboloid of constant phi. Uh, and, so, and this is the most general 
solution, or I guess maximal extension of the solution of this equation. Um, okay, fine, but you know, the whole point, right, that we were discussing is, okay, so which of these solutions are allowed and which ones are distinct um, given the boundary conditions and the restrictions on, on what we gauge and what we don't? Okay, that's what we need to do if we really want to identify the physical degrees of freedom. Um, so let me first focus on just the intrinsic part of the solution. So that's like, that's like the electric field in the previous example. That's the stuff you can just measure sitting somewhere in space. Okay. So to find the intrinsic data, we, just, we allow ourselves to do any gauge transformations that we want. Um, and in particular, um, this geometry, this ADS2, has, has an isometry, SO2, comma 1, um, which lets us choose either B equals C equals 0 or A equals B equals 0 in these uh, solutions, basically based on whether this vector is time-like or space-like. Um, so, uh, and then if we want to avoid a, a time-like singularity between the boundaries, then we have to choose a formal one. Um, so here's what the solution looks like. So this is a little bit scary, so let's just go through it slowly. It's the same picture one had, but uh, so that the asymptotic boundaries are going from this dot to that dot, and then from this dot to that dot, and phi is infinity there. Then there are these sort of horizon-type things where phi is equal to A, Remember, A is this thing that appeared here, and we set B and C to zero. Um, uh, and then phi equals zero are these lines here. Uh, and so phi kind of moves from infinity along lines sort of like that to, to finite, and then from up in positive, and then up here to zero, and then it gets negative up here and eventually makes it out to minus infinity out here. Um, yeah, phi is the scalar. No, no, but that, yeah, but the boundary conditions had, um, had this RC in it that was the IR cutoff. So phi goes to infinity in the, in the, in the IR limit. Yeah, you just kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, it, this is Dirichlet boundary condition, but then I take RC to infinity. Yeah. Um, right. So, um, so, okay, now I should say it's, it's not really clear how seriously to take these phi equals minus infinity boundaries. I, I think you shouldn't take them so seriously. So probably, you know, in, when you get into some, example of this where it's coupled to matter and so on, you should think of there being a singularity at least on this null cone here, if not, if not sooner, uh, which cuts off the space time. And then you get this, worse, this wormhole. Th then this is like, you can basically think of this as a singularity with a wormhole with two asymptotic boundaries. Yeah. What? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, right. Well, that's a field redefinition. Yeah. I mean, I think I think I made some choice by not putting a plus two in the finite term or something, right? I mean, uh, yeah. There's there's some choice there. Oh uh, no, wrong. No, no. Well, I, no. Be, remember, we're talking about the intrinsic data. So I'm allowed to use the SL2 isometry to choose. Basically, I chose so that the bifurcate horizon would be sitting here in the middle. So that when I said B equals C equals zero. Um, it does. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is not phi plus phi naught. Yeah. Yeah, which is some negative value up here. And, and so, yeah, yeah, but if you say that, then you decide the singularity is some time like thing up here. But I, I mean, I, I, I tend to think it's wrong. It doesn't matter for what I'm going to say, but I, I, well, I, don't, I think it's kind of, I, I think that theory kind of doesn't make sense if you try to do it that way. Um, I mean, there will always be fluctuations that, that, that make a singularity before you get to that. Um, okay. So, 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 so let, me, let, me, let me pick some coordinates to make this a little bit less abstract. So, if, so these are basically the same coordinates Juan was using, global coordinates. Um, so I think x squared plus 1, I think, is 1 over sine of, Whatever he had, yeah. Um, and then this is what the dilaton looks like. Um, okay. Now it's convenient also to introduce. Uh, so these are the coordinates where the time slices just go across like this. Um, so it's also convenient to do sort of Schwarzschild type coordinates, where you instead use phi as the radial coordinate. Um, so th then I call it Schwarzschild because indeed they kind of live in the sort of right exterior here, say. Uh, and then you have to do some analytic continuation to get anywhere else. Um, so, uh, and in particular, I want to emphasize that A, this parameter I'm calling A, is also equal, just equal to the value of phi at the, at the horizon. And so, in fact, from now on, I'm going to, instead of calling it A, I'm going to call it phi h, so that we can remember it's just the value of the delta at the horizon. 
Okay. And then we can, uh, on the solution, we can evaluate the stress tensor to find the energy, and it's just, uh, which is h left plus h right, and it's twice phi h squared over lambda. Where again, let me remind you, lambda is this thing that appeared in the boundary conditions for phi. It's the thing that multiplies the cutoff. Um, okay. Now, um, as with electromagnetism, so, so far here we found one degree of freedom. We found phi h, right? The value of phi at the horizon, it was a in this solution. Uh, but that can't be the only degree of freedom. Again, phase space has to be even dimensional, so there better be another degree of freedom. Um, so, as before, we can, we can find the other degree of freedom by acting on this solution with an illegal gauge transformation. Right? Uh, so let's think about the, a few different time slices of this geometry. So this is the same intrinsic geometry. It's like, uh, you know, like having the fixed electric field, but we're considering cutting it at different times. And then the, remember that um, we're not quotienting by diffeomorphisms that approach non-trivial time translations at infinity, okay? So, so this state here and, and this state are different states in the Hilbert space. Or, well, it's classical, so they're different points in phase space. Right. But um, what about this one? So, so is this one equal to this one or that one? Well, I guess I didn't really give you enough information, but if I tell you that the, the, the time advance of this and the time delay, uh, decrease of that are equal, then actually this is the same as that. Because there's, because there's an exact isometry of this that's also respected by the dilaton, which is where we go up by a and down by mi on one side and down by minus a on the other side. And so that really describes the same initial data. So th this time slice and this time slice are the same point in phase space, but these two are not. Um, so, so then there has to be some other degree of freedom, which was analogous to the Wilson line in electromagnetism, which keeps track of sort of which time we are in these, uh, where, where we draw the two times. So there are various ways to think about that. So here's one way that I like to think about it. So we, you know, we, we take whatever state we're in, and at t equals zero on the left side, we shoot a geodesic into the bulk, which is uh, pointing in the direction of the gradient of phi. Uh, so, and then we, it, event, it gets to the right boundary at some time, which we can call minus two delta. So for example, in this example, right, you know, we go down like that. Um, and then we can just take this delta to be our additional degree of freedom. So were we at t equals zero in the thermofield double state, right? When we go across, we come, we get over at t equals zero. So delta is zero if we're on the usual time slice of the Schwarzschild geometry. But on a different time slice, this delta will not be zero. And in fact, so if this TL and TR are the usual coordinates for the Schwarzschild thing, then this delta is TL plus TR uh, if, that's, if those are the points where you anchor the slice. So, so delta and phi h together parameterize a two-dimensional phase space where delta can be any, any real number and phi h is positive. Uh, oh, I forgot a space. And, and then the equations of motion are kind of trivial. So delta dot is one and phi dot h is zero, phi, phi h dot is zero. Uh, and then if you look at the form of the Hamiltonian, which remember we derived before from the stress tensor, then you can read off the symplectic form. So in terms of delta and phi h, it's this. And it's actually even simpler if you write it in terms of delta and h. Uh, it's just d delta uh, wedge d h. Um, and so, oh, um, okay, I guess I have different resolution on my monitor than this computer does. Uh, so this is not the union of two non-trivial systems. Uh, and so this is the classical version of the factorization problem. That's what the bottom of that should say. Um, so in particular, it's not two copies of the Schwarzian theory, at least not in the sense that you if you think the Schwarzian theory makes sense on one boundary and then you take two copies. So what Juan did is more complicated than that, right? What he did was he took two different things where he didn't, he did a different quotient when he had two theories than he did when he would have done when he had one. Okay, but that's not taking the union of two physical systems uh, and neither is this. All right, so, so that's it for the classical thing. So now let's talk about the, the, the quantum, uh, quantizing this. So, so at first it seems kind of trivial, right? So we have a continuous set of states labeled by energy. Uh, they're eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, big shot. Uh, and then we can define the canonical conjugate of the Hamiltonian, which you see here is what is this delta. So it should just be I D D E. Um, but this is a little bit complicated because, well, the Hilbert space, remember the energy is, is positive. 
And so maybe you heard at some point that there's no time operator in quantum mechanics. So, so what that means and what is reflected here is that this delta is actually not a, a self-adjoint operator on the Hilbert space. So it's a Hermitian but not self-adjoint operator. So one of those things that you hope you never have to worry about it. But here, here with this delta, you, you would have to worry about it. And so since it's not self-adjoint, it doesn't have eigenstates, right? The spectral theorem does not apply. Um, so, and this actually, this is true for a kind of trivial reason. It's because even in the classical problem, if you, if you took delta the, and generated evolution by delta, right? Because it canonically commutes with h, you can just move h around. In particular, you could move it to be negative. So, so by evolving for a finite amount of time with delta, you can sort of hit the boundary of phase space. And that's why it's a bad operator quantum mechanically. Um, so, okay, but we don't have to give up. We can just find a better function on phase space than the time shift operator. Uh, and so the, the one, one which is, I think is particularly nice is you take the renormalized geodistic distance between the zeros of time on the two boundaries, right? So, so the, 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 the geodistic distance is infinite because the because we, in, the, in, the lim, in the IR in limit of RC goes to infinity. But you can subtract off some universal divergence to get a renormalized geodesic distance, and it just ends up being this. So it's some function on the phase space that we were talking about, but this is a good function. So if we evolve with it, it doesn't uh, crash us into the boundary of phase space. So this should be a good operator. All right, so then there are various uh, things we could do. Um, so one fun thing, which I'll talk about now, is um, we can use this machinery, we can compute the, Hartle, the wave functional of the hartle hawking state with temperature beta as a function of this L, okay? Which is kind of, you know, by, by explicit, by doing the Euclidean path integral in the bulk. Um, so let me just briefly talk about that. So, so the definition of the hartle hawking state is that we do the Euclidean path integral where, um, where the boundary conditions are that uh, we have a geodesic here of renormalized length L. That's the project onto a definite eigenstate of this L operator. And then down here at the asymptotic boundary, we have a, a distance which in terms of the boundary metric is beta over two, and then we have to rescale by this RC to get the, the bulk distance from one end to the other. Uh, so we want to do this path integral. Um, so in the semi-classical limit, which is, I, I'm just going to do it in the semi-classical limit, so that's when lambda, that was this thing that appeared in the boundary conditions, is large. Remember the boundary conditions were phi goes to lambda times RC at infinity. Um, so le lambda being large is kind of the, the thing that makes it semi-classical. It would be like n in higher dimensions. Um, okay. And so, so the saddle point for this is some geometry in here, which will have its own Schwarzschild radius. Uh, you know, it, so it'll still be some Euclidean solution, but it, it won't necessarily have a, a, a Schwarzschild radius related to beta by, by, by being 2 pi over beta. It, it'll be some parameter that we can tune, and there'll be some geodesic that we could move around uh, inside of that geometry to try to match these boundary conditions. Um, okay, so when you do this, and so I won't inflict the details on you, but this is what the wave function looks like. So it has some reasonably simple form in terms of a parameter RS, which is basically the, the Schwarzschild radius in the solution. Uh, but then you have to relate that to L by solving some implicit, implicitly solving some equation here. So uh, this wave function, uh, well, okay, it's peaked where it, it should be. It's peaked um, at the L, which corresponds to just taking the disk at the Schwarzschild radius set by the temperature beta and then cutting it in half, right, which kind of makes sense. If you, the norm of the thermofield double stage, which is dominated by the peak of the wave function, should be dominated by, where, you know, that's integrating over L. Then it should be dominated just by the disk uh, solution that you would use to compute the partition function. Um, and then there's some width around that peak, which is of order square root of beta over L. So in the semi-classical limit where lambda is large, then the width uh, gets small. Um, all right, and now just because I know some of you really like this kind of thing, so I have to mention it. So, so when you do this computation, it's really important to think about the corner terms in the action that come up here, okay? If you're, if you're not careful about the corner terms, you get the wrong answer. So, so that's a fun little exercise to figure out how to modify the action I wrote before to, to include the right corner terms to make this calculation work. Um, okay, but anyways, since most of you probably think that would be horrible, I won't talk about it. All right. So, uh, okay, let me, almost done here, Rob. Um, so, uh, so, so you, thinking about these kind of things, we can also get a new 
perspective on this factorization problem I mentioned before. So for a sec, let's uh, imagine that actually the Hilbert space did factorize. So I said, it, I said it didn't, but let's just imagine that it did. So then here's an equation that would be true. If we computed the trace of e to the minus beta h left plus h right, then we would just get the square of the one-sided partition function, right? Because we just split the state into two, into two factors. Um, so here, here's an equation that would be true. Um, and actually, this right-hand side, you can compute in the jakeev teitelboim theory just by doing the Euclidean path integral. So these guys did this, so I don't know if they're the first ones to do it. Anyway, here's the answer. Um, but if you try to compute the left-hand side using the bulk jakeev teitelboim theory, you get stuck. Because you have this trace here, which is in this Hilbert space that we've been talking about from quantizing this two-dimensional phase space. Um, but this E is a continuous variable, so this trace doesn't make sense. You, know, you don't get to take the trace over a continuous variable. Um, now, you might say, all right, I mean, come on, Daniel. You, you, you already explained to us how the bulk theory doesn't factorize. So wh why are you telling us about an identity that would be true assuming it factorizes? OK, fair enough. Um, but I think that we can use this calculation to get some sense of what we need to add to the theory so that it factorizes. Right. So um, in particular, let me, let me do a quick model where you just think about the quantum mechanics of a particle on a circle of radius r. So since the particle has a compact target space, the spectrum is discrete, and trace of e to the minus beta h makes sense. Okay. And then you can ask, OK, what happens to trace of e to the minus beta h in the limit that I take the radius of the circle to infinity? And what, what happens is that you get out in front, so you get in, you know, the, the sum becomes an integral in the right way, but then you have to get this factor of r out here in front to cancel the units in dE. And so it goes to infinity in the limit of, uh, of taking the radius to infinity. So, so in some sense, we should think of the trace on the left-hand side of this equation as measuring kind of the volume of the time shift operator, telling you, te you know, like, like the radius of this particle in the circle here. Um, and so what the finite answer that we got for the right-hand side of the equation says is that the Euclidean path integral is really smart. It knows about this cutoff on the range of the time shift. You know? uh, and it tells us that the range of the time shift should really be of order z of beta squared. It shouldn't be infinity. You know, so delta, our delta ran from minus infinity to infinity. But that's because you know, we somehow, we were working in a theory where this, uh, you know, where the it wasn't smart enough, for example, to give a trace interpretation to the Euclidean path integral. And so actually, this mismatch between the Euclidean and Lorentzian calculation, I, I think of it as some manifestation of the black hole information problem, right? It's this old puzzle. You know, how is the Euclidean path integral for gravity so smart? It can count the microstates of the black hole just using the low energy effective action. Right? It's crazy. And if you try to do that using the Lorentzian theory, no such luck. OK, so, so one example of how you can do this, and it really is the end, Rob, I promise. Um, so uh, you can consider two copies of Lorenzian SYK. So that's what Juan was talking about. Um, and this jakeev teitelboim theory, somehow it has to come out at low temperature. But you could ask, how is this consistent with the, the way that it factorizes? Okay. And so the answer is that these two-sided operators, like delta and L, they're made out of two-sided bilinears in the SYK model, where you kind of mix together psi left and psi right. Um, and then you sum over, over n of these guys. Um, and so we need, the funny thing is that we need the matter fields to build the low energy sector, even though that low energy sector and its effective action doesn't have any of these matter fields. Uh, and this is, this is actually the last slide. Um, the <laughs> this is actually the same resolution that I gave for the, for the factorization problem in EM. We need these heavy charges to split the Wilson line. I mean, actually, this bilinear formula combining n of the charges, I actually had for, in my paper also for the Wilson line uh, in terms of some sigma, CPN sigma model. Um, so I think understanding these charge constituents which split the gravitational degrees of freedom is somehow the essential problem in, un part in understanding how to interpret black hole entropy and Lorentzian signature. Um, and so not having that is what makes things like the trying to do the entropy and turn Simons fail. All right, great. Muchas gracias. Okay, we'll take one question while we're uh, switching over here. Is yeah. There... By the way, this picture is like two minutes from here, so you should go look at this view while you're here. <laughs>
Well, there, I mean, there is no SL2R. Uh, yeah, there's just no, I mean, it's broken by the boundary. It's explicitly broken by the boundary condition. So, so I, I sometimes, Juan, Juan said it's only a little bit broken, but I mean, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I just think it's just broken. It's not there. There's no global, you know, there's no action on the Hilbert, action of SL2R in the Hilbert space. Um, yeah, I mean, there are no there states are that transform. Uh, yeah, I'm a little skeptical of that. I mean, didn't you write a paper saying that there isn't, that one cited? I mean, yeah, I, I think it's, I, yeah, I mean, certainly if you look, well, it's, it's gone, but if we went back to the variation of the action that I wrote down, uh, I, I think we'd be hard pressed to come up with boundary conditions that would uh, be good boundary conditions that would preserve the symmetry. The Schwarzman action comes in front of the Schwarzman. Uh, no. Well, no, no, there's the SL2R and the Schwarzman is the other SL2R, right? So the, the, there's the diff of S1 mod SL2R thing. That's the other SL2R. That's the gauged one. So that, I, I mean, that's why I tried to give the whole talk without using the word Schwarzman and SL2R. I don't like talking about fake things. I mean, I just, you know, I was confused for a year trying to understand these things. I mean, I, they, they, I mean again, they're not wrong. What they say is correct, but, but I, I just, I don't know. If you try to think about it in terms of the SL2R, you have to be a smartest one to understand what's going on. Uh, you have to use a thing that doesn't exist. We, we still seem to be working on the crossover, so if there's another question. Well, that's because he wanted global ADS2. I wasn't trying for that. So, my, I mean, my dilaton had some, uh, had some profile, and uh, there were th these singularities. So, so and I, I certainly wasn't adding a coupling like that. Okay, yeah, you won. So, my question yeah. is, how are you getting the two boundaries to work? So, the, the dilaton has the same boundary conditions as the two in the, in the one. Well, you could say he added a source to change the boundary conditions in some sense, right? I mean, uh, they coupled the two. So he added a non-local source. No, 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 no. My solution, no, no. The metric part of the solution is the same, but the phi part is different. And so when, when you talk, that's the thing. When you talk about the symmetry, don't just look at the metric. Then you think there's SL2. You have to look at the phi also. I mean, that's a field, right? So you have to. At infinity, but not inside. It's, it's I mean, in, in phi, the, this condition that phi goes to something non-zero at the boundary just breaks the SL2. If you do an SL2 transformation of a, of a place where phi is constant, you don't get another slice where phi is constant. It's just not a symmetry of any configuration. You can continue that in the yeah. All right. Uh, but, but we should thank uh, the yeah.